Weiss and Associates presents The Federal Income Tax and the Private Sector Employer. The focus of this video is to enlarge your awareness about federal income taxation. Our points are all based on enacted federal tax laws and are not personal opinions being presented to create issues. The law is the law, and it's adhered to in this presentation. Perhaps for the first time, you, the private sector employer, are about to see without obstruction or bias how and to whom the federal income tax laws are correctly directed. Like others, private sector employers should adhere to jurisdictional laws to which they actually apply. The private sector employer must honor statements and declarations made by their employees about their status in regard to which jurisdiction they are lawfully identified to be within, and then to fully understand how those laws actually apply to each. Presumptions about the hybridization of societal norms regarding liability for the federal income tax, as well as the lack of awareness of jurisdictional limitations for the proper application of the income tax laws, must come to the forefront. The goal of this video is to provide you, the private sector employer, with information that perhaps has not been noticed in the past or contemplated about for a long time. Your preeminent role as a private sector employer is to do the work that your legal fiction was established to perform within the jurisdictional framework of the laws. As an employer, you might employ a legal staff to help the firm with its daily needs considering the implications and guidelines of the legal system that can impact your enterprise. You simply trust the educational background of the attorney or attorneys working for your firm to be those who know the legal system correctly. Compliance to the jurisdictional laws is a huge cost to any business, and it goes without saying that accuracy and adherence to the law is indispensable. Here is a perplexing question. What if your understandings about the federal income tax fall short of the reality you have operated under for many years? This is similar to what Galileo Galilei did at his time in history, when he faced the paradigm of his day in proving the earth was not flat, in spite of the fact that those in society at that time had spent their lives believing something that was not accurate. Please take a moment to think about this quote from Mark Twain. He is credited for saying, It is not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It is what you know for sure that is not so. As we move forward, keep Mark Twain's wisdom as a harbinger so that you can ascertain if what you currently think you know is indeed lawfully correct in regard to federal income taxation. Most anyone would say today that the federal income tax applies to all Americans who were born in one of the 50 states and cite the 16th Amendment as the foundation for that societal paradigm. Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State, is credited for the following statement. It is not a matter of what is true that counts, but a matter of what is perceived to be true. What if the perceptions of the taxation of your employees have been based more on the appearance of the truth rather than the truth? All we ask in watching this video is to keep an open mind and don't shut down your cognitive abilities. It will take just a few minutes to finish listening to this presentation and the data provided will allow you to ascertain if it is information that will be of value to your firm or not. So. We ask for your consent to spend a short amount of time to review this video and to think about the facts of law presented. We know today that Galileo was correct. It took a valiant effort to inform those of his day with the realities of the truth. Today, we merely look back to his time with the advantage of hindsight in knowing that he was correct and the Flat Earth Society died once the truth of his discovery was validated. Once something is discovered and proven, it appears to be self-evident. It took the discovery of the truth to change the societal paradigm of his day, and yet the same human condition remains in our time. There are two types of employers we will discuss, and two very different jurisdictions as well. Each type of employer has a distinct jurisdiction to be aware of in regard to the proper application of the facts, and to attempt to eliminate the presumptions from prior conditioning about the federal income tax. Thus, we begin with the term employer and will now look more closely at the two types of employers that we will be discussing. The first type is private sector employers. 
This group consists of small, medium, and large multinational businesses that create products and services for consumption by Americans, and perhaps some are producing products for global distribution. For the most part, we are addressing the private sector employers who sell their products and services in malls, gas stations, and strip centers, the transportation of those goods, and so on throughout the 50 states. These private sector employers are generally considered to be the ones that keep America running and support the middle class in driving the economic engine. These employers collect many taxes for the governments that exist in the public sector. Examples of such taxes are sales taxes, property taxes, state income taxes, and federal income taxes. The jurisdiction for this group is the Constitutional Republic, the 50 states of the Union. The system of laws within this jurisdiction is based on common law, which is of, by, and for the American people, and is not based on territorial statutes and regulations. Within this jurisdiction, the U.S. Constitution is in full force and effect, or is supposed to be, if there has not been a coup d'etat that has ended the Constitutional Republic. American nationals born in this jurisdiction have unalienable rights and are protected from intrusions by the national government via the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and other amendments to that Constitution. In this jurisdiction, where the private sector employers function, the common law is the lawful system of governance as established by the Founding Fathers who created the nation. The basic tenets of these laws are stated in the Declaration of Independence and the Federalist Papers, and have been woven into the U.S. Constitution to protect all American nationals from unwarranted intrusions by the national government. The Founding Fathers were all too familiar with the kinds of intrusions that occurred with an unbridled government of men seeking control over others and their property. The second type is public sector employers. This group consists of city, county, state, and federal employers. For the topic of this narrative, we will now focus only on the largest of these groups, the national government. Politicians run these types of corporations. Yes, they're all corporations, and they have statutes and regulations that they need your consent in order to make you compliant to their legal system. If you don't choose to operate by their rules, you don't have to. However, if your private sector employees have submitted to the national government's request for their consent to be guided and controlled by federal statutory rules, and then those private sector employees begin to resist, they can be financially penalized, perhaps have their personal property taken, and wages taken from them for noncompliance. This is where the concept of tax cheats and tax evaders originated. It's been noticed in rare circumstances that some legal taxpayers are incarcerated because of granting their former consent to be treated like a U.S. resident alien under the IRS statutes and regulations. All federal employees, federal officers, and elected federal officials operate in a public office within the territory or public sector known as the District of Columbia, which also includes territories like Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Within this jurisdiction, the U.S. Constitution is not law. That is not a misstatement. The United States Constitution, to whom all federal workers take an oath of office to protect and to defend, is not law within the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia and its territories are territorial properties of the U.S. Congress, which is the crown of that government corporation. It creates rules for its jurisdiction with legislative acts of Congress via its plethora of statutes and regulations. The problem for many is trying to ascertain if such legislative acts of Congress meet the jurisdictional requirements of the U.S. Constitution in order to be actually be made applicable within the Constitutional Republic. The ability to locate the jurisdiction for each piece of legislation is a full-time job, and unfortunately, the reference to jurisdiction on any law should be self-evident, but all too often is obscured. The Federal Register Act requires that any implementing regulation that applies toward American nationals working in the private sector be published in the Federal Register and recorded by volume, date, and page number. Again, the national government is a corporation that is ruled by statutes and regulations. The national government must acquire the consent of each American national before it can legally impose its statutes and regulations upon anyone. 
Statutes and regulations are legislative rules of their society that is given the force of law only by those who consent to it if they were not born or created subject to it. If you are not one who is aware of the requirement of consent, then you've probably already granted consent to the national government to participate in its income tax plan even without knowing you did such, as the national government often uses consent granted sub silentio or under silence. Hopefully, by now, you might be thinking a little more about the two kinds of employers that exist and the concept of jurisdiction for the application of the different types of laws unique to each jurisdiction. Now is a perfect time to direct our discussion toward the jurisdiction of the national government and its relationship to or impact on private sector employers. In looking at the two groups of employers, it is worth repeating that there are two jurisdictions that exist. It is important that your employees inform you, the private sector employer, as to their correct status and jurisdiction to which they are associated. Jurisdiction is a critical distinction to be understood as it impacts what you, the private sector employer, must do for the two separate classifications of employees that exist. Jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of the Constitutional Republic and its distinction from IRC statutory laws. The Constitutional Republic is the landmass that makes up the now 50 states of the Union. This area is called by many the United States of America, or the United States. This is the geographical area in which the U.S. Constitution is the law of the land, and those born in this jurisdiction are protected by the U.S. Constitution and enjoy unalienable rights. The national government has little impact on this area, or at least it's supposed to and has no authority to compel any American national to associate with either the national government or its statutory-based income tax rules. This is based on law found in the following. 1. The U.S. Supreme Court decision in Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust Company, in which this court held that any attempt by the national government to impose a federal income tax without the rule of apportionment, as required of it by Article I, Sections 2 and 9 of the U.S. Constitution, would and can only be considered as an unconstitutional act. The ratification of this amendment was the direct consequence of the court's decision in 1895 in Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust Company, whereby the attempt of Congress the previous year to tax incomes uniformly throughout the United States was held by a divided court to be unconstitutional. A tax on incomes derived from property, the court declared, was a direct tax which government, under the terms of Article I, Sections 2 and 9, could impose only by the rule of apportionment according to population. Therefore, any kind of a direct tax must adhere to the rule of apportionment if it's to be made applicable within the Constitutional Republic. 2. Former President of the United States William H. Taft stated in part in his legislative intent of the 16th Amendment as follows. The decision of the Supreme Court in the income tax case deprived the national government of a power which, by reason of previous decisions of the court, it was generally supposed that government had. I therefore recommend to the Congress that both houses, by a two-thirds vote, shall propose an amendment to the Constitution conferring the power to levy an income tax upon the national government without apportionment among the states in proportion to population. The key elements of Taft's intention with the 16th Amendment can be summarized by statements made reflecting that the national government was, one, deprived of any power to impose a federal income tax upon American nationals. Two, was required, in order to pass the 16th Amendment without interference from the U.S. Supreme Court's rule of apportionment requirement per the U.S. Constitution, that the Congress must omit any reference to the rule of apportionment in proportion to population. Three, was only making the federal income tax levied active upon the territorial jurisdiction known as the District of Columbia, which is referred to by the national government as the United States, as it consists of Washington, D.C., and territories like Guam, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And four, was only permitted with the possibility of the jurisdictional application for the 16th Amendment to be operational within the territorial jurisdiction of the District of Columbia. Otherwise, the U.S. Supreme Court would not permit it to be applicable within the Constitutional Republic, as stated in the Pollock decision, and the U.S. Supreme Court would have struck it down as unconstitutional within the Constitutional Republic. 
Three, the 16th Amendment conforms to the jurisdictional limitations, as it is stated in the U.S. Constitution as follows. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes, from whatever source derived, without apportionment among the several states, and without regard to any census or enumeration. And four, any American national who is an employee working in the private sector has never been imposed with or had the federal income tax levied upon them. This is factual due to the protections established by the U.S. Constitution and upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Pollock decision back in 1895. Any request by a private sector employee who is an American national and states they are not a U.S. taxpayer is perfectly lawful and valid. No IRC Chapter 24 withholding is permitted upon these American nationals by the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Pollock case. These American national employees cannot be compelled by the private sector employer to fill out IRS forms such as the form W-4, as American nationals are those who are neither of the subject nor of the object of federal revenue laws. These American nationals are protected by the U.S. Constitution and the 13th Amendment against any type of compelled association, slavery, or involuntary indentured financial servitude by force or attempts at intimidation by any party. The Distinction and Importance of the Territorial Jurisdiction of the National Government This jurisdiction is a territorial jurisdiction that consists of the District of Columbia and, after the Spanish-American War, it added its U.S. territories. The Constitution addresses the District of Columbia as an exclusive and sovereign jurisdiction for the operation of the national government to provide its constitutionally required duties to American nationals. This scattered landmass of territories is commonly referred to by those in the national government as the United States, and has led to part of the confusion when the definition of that term is not defined on documentation created by the national government. It can only use its statutory and regulatory laws within its limited territorial jurisdiction, unless an implementing regulation is published in the Federal Register. One has to create a Freedom of Information Act FOIA request to get the Office of the Federal Register to search its parallel table of authorities to see if there's a published regulation in the Federal Register. The simplicity of simply listing the jurisdiction any act of Congress creates in the upper right-hand corner of the act would greatly improve the awareness of American nationals without having to go through the formality of a FOIA request. Former President Franklin D. Roosevelt is credited as having stated, Governments never do anything by accident. If government does something, you can bet it was carefully planned. Perhaps, just perhaps, this has contributed to the avoidance of the simplicity in identification of jurisdiction on laws. The District of Columbia is certainly not a state of the Union. It is, in fact, a separate and distinct territorial jurisdiction from the 50 states of the Union. The national government recognizes the 50 states of the Union as foreign jurisdictions to their territorial jurisdiction. It also recognizes that the U.S. Constitution is only law within the Constitutional Republic, and that is not law within the District of Columbia. The U.S. Congress has created huge volumes of rules, meaning statutory laws and regulations that apply only toward those within that limited territorial jurisdiction. These rules that only apply within its territorial boundary, such as the Internal Revenue Code, can never be made applicable toward American nationals in the Constitutional Republic without first having been granted consent by each American national. This is the significance of why an implementing regulation is required by federal law that the implementing regulation be first published in the Federal Register. The federal regulation that requires that an implementing regulation be published in the Federal Register is found at 26 CFR section 601.702A1, which states in part, The IRS is required under 5 U.S.C. A1 to state separately and publish currently in the Federal Register for the guidance of the public the following information. D. Substantive rules of general applicability adopted as authorized by law and statement of general policy or interpretations of general applicability formulated and adopted by the IRS. Further down in this administrative regulation, at 26 CFR section 601.702A2II, effective failure to publish, 
one finds the following stated in part. Which is required to be published in the Federal Register, such person is not required in any manner to resort to or be adversely affected by such matter if it is not so published or is not incorporated by reference therein pursuant to paragraph A2I of this section. Thus, for example, any such matter which imposes an obligation and which is not so published or incorporated by reference shall not adversely change or affect a person's rights. Michael L. White, former federal attorney working in the office of the Federal Register, stated back in 1994 his legal opinion to summarize his findings about any implementing regulation pertaining to the federal income tax toward American nationals living and working in the private sector as follows. Our records indicate that the Internal Revenue Service has not incorporated by reference in the Federal Register a requirement to make an income tax return. The reason is the limited territorial jurisdiction for the 16th Amendment, established without regard to the rule of apportionment as previously discussed. For those private sector employers, Federal Attorney Michael L. White stipulated in part, the parallel table of authorities and rules, a finding aid compiled and published by the Office of the Federal Register as a part of the CFR Index, indicates that implementing regulations for the sections cited above have been published in various parts of Title 27 of the Code of Federal Regulations. There are no corresponding entries to Title 26. Mr. White was referring here to implementing regulations related to enforcement actions such as IRS tax levies and IRS tax liens, as he stated. You have asked whether Internal Revenue Service provisions codified at 26 U.S.C. 6020, 6201, 6203, 6301, 6303, 6321, 6331 through 6343, 6601, 6602, 6651, 6701, and 7207 have been processed or included in 26 CFR Part 1. This is the impact on his earlier statement about there are no corresponding entries for Title 26. The reason is that these kinds of enforcement actions, liens and levies, are permissible only upon statutory U.S. persons within the territorial jurisdiction of the national government, the District of Columbia, where statutes and regulations do impact those subject to that territorial jurisdiction. It, however, does not extend into the Constitutional Republic for application toward those American nationals who work in the private sector and are neither of the subject nor of the object of federal revenue laws. Due to the restrictions placed against the national government by the U.S. Supreme Court, this is the only jurisdiction in which the 16th Amendment is applicable. The federal income tax cannot be levied upon any American national without their consent, and for some American nationals who have elected to work for the national government. Any consent provided to the national government must have been a knowing and willful act on the part of the American national who consented in order to avoid fraud by the national government to secure consent from American nationals to tax their income like that of a U.S. resident alien. In this perspective, any IRC Chapter 24 withholding for the federal income tax upon American nationals living and working in the private sector falls under the United States Supreme Court decision in the Pollock case. To forcibly withhold any earnings of an American national who has never made an election to allow the national government to treat their earnings like that of a U.S. resident alien falls under the umbrella of an unconstitutional act as stated by the Supreme Court. This is further supported by Taft's legislative intent of the 16th Amendment in which the federal income tax was only levied upon the national government and not upon American nationals. Vital to remember it is also an unconstitutional act for anyone to compel others to associate with the national government against their will. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution very clearly shows that such compelled association is a form of slavery or involuntary indentured financial servitude. Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. There is no gray area about the intent of the 13th Amendment, and it behooves all private sector employers to avoid this issue. 
That is why this information is presented. For those American nationals who did make an election, this can also be true due to the provision in the Internal Revenue Code at Section 6013G4A, Termination of Election. The automatic renewal of participation in the U.S. income tax scheme comes to an abrupt end starting in the year in which the American national chooses to terminate that participation. Keep in mind that all statutes and regulations are the creation of the U.S. Congress, and it was the U.S. Congress that made this option available to all American nationals who wish to stop their participation in the payments of a federal income tax. If you read this section in the IRC, Section 6013G4A, you will notice the term non-resident alien individual. This is the expression to refer to those American nationals, and is a statutory term the Congress created to slightly obfuscate in the minds of the reader just whom Congress was referring to. The clarity for this equivalency of terms, non-resident alien individuals, meaning American nationals, is found at 26 CFR section 1.871-1B4, where it discusses expatriation. We will go into greater detail on this in part two of this video. There will be even greater revelations provided in part two of this presentation, so we invite you to view it. You, the private sector employer, have now seen that there are two jurisdictions to consider, and only one jurisdiction, the territorial jurisdiction of the District of Columbia, is subject to the federal income tax statutes and regulations. Keep in mind that both are referred to by the expression, the United States. The Constitutional Republic is the domicile of the vast majority of American nationals, and the other being the territorial jurisdiction of the District of Columbia. One must be very cautious so as to not confuse the two jurisdictions. The massive number of federal statutes and regulations rarely attach to the Constitutional Republic, and if they do, such laws must be in the form of an implementing regulation, and it must be published in the Federal Register, evidenced by volume, date, and page number. Additionally, there are two types of private sector employees. One, those who are American nationals, not subject to the territorial jurisdiction of the District of Columbia, and remain protected by the U.S. Constitution. And two, those American nationals who granted consent to be taxed like resident aliens and are taxed via the Internal Revenue Code at 26 CFR section 1.871-1A. By their granting such consent, they have laid aside their constitutional protections afforded by the U.S. Constitution and are viewed by their voluntary election as U.S. resident aliens by the national government. If you have found this information of value, we invite you to check out our website's resource center, which will further provide information of the limited territorial jurisdictional scope of the federal income tax toward only those who are subject to the statutory rules found within the Internal Revenue Code. We thank you for your time and attention and hope you will continue this topic in Part 2.